Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Win with Heather Havenwood. I am so excited that you're here today because I have a powerhouse game changer badass on the line with me today. So listen up because I really have someone amazing. Esther, are you there? I am. <laughs> All right, Esther. I know you're laughing, you're giggling over there, but it's true. So I'm going to explain to you who Esther is first before I ask her amazing questions. And so Esther Weinberg is a powerhouse game changer. She really is. She's a leader in redefining organizational culture by focusing on power and leadership through dignity. Esther, the founder of Mindlight Group and her team, help mid to large size media companies and their employees, especially their executive leadership team, to find, implement, and mentor dignity, leadership, and personal power in the workplace. Esther is a powerhouse game changer who has successfully transformed organizations, particularly large media companies, executive leaders, and teams for over 20 years. From a Disney executive to an expert in organizational leadership development, Esther's unique training and mentorship ability taps into the pulse of the current challenges today's media, publishing, and tech companies are facing internally and internationally. Esther's personal mission is to bring dignity and mentorship back into the workforce on a worldwide scale, personal power through dignity, leadership through dignity, and bringing dignity back into the business one conversation at a time. I told you she's a powerhouse. <laughs> Not bad. Not I think bad, that's right? Yeah. Like, is that me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ask my mother, she'll tell you. <laughs> she'll tell you. She is a powerhouse. So I just want to just that, I mean, obviously that's your bio and that's sure. who you are. And you you come from a lineage of media and Disney and you, I want you to explain a little bit what your background is. But first, there's this word, there's this word that's in your bio that's just so unique and rich mm -hmm. and it's a word called dignity. Something that I feel personally has been kind of lost yes. in, our world, in our world today. And so I want to start there. What is dignity to you and what does that mean? You know, it's an interesting thing because I find that dignity is a few things. And the reason why it's lost in companies that you're seeing it today, because you're seeing movements like what happened with Harvey Weinstein or the Me Too movement. That's very overt. You're seeing that you say, man, of course there's no dignity anymore, especially in Hollywood. You know, look what's happening. But it's, I have to tell you that dignity is small and big things. So when I say mm -hmm. dignity, I'm talking about how do we choose to treat each other in the workplace and how do we choose to treat ourselves? Oftentimes what happens is that there's two, both those things tend to get lost. If you think of it, you spend more time at work than you do anywhere else. So all your warts and your good behavior and your bad behavior is gonna come out at work. It's just the way that it is. So if you love yourself, you're gonna love yourself at work and you'll tend to love other people. But if you have a disproportionate relationship with yourself, that'll come out pretty heftily at work. So for example, if you're not confident, confidence will come up in the workplace. So maybe in when you're sitting in a meeting, you should be more vocal, you're more quiet. So the impact of that is that people around you don't get to hear your wisdom and your contribution and your ideas. And then what happens is you are seen as someone who might be seen as small or not a contributor, or hey, why did we hire that person? Or what are we doing? So it gets, so dignity gets a little bit lost, but it's about how in basic ways, it's how I choose to treat me and how I choose to treat other people at work in a way that elevates myself and each other. Okay, so what I hear is a couple things. There's so much mm -hmm. there. So there's a core of understanding human behavior and humanity within oneself is like the first, like starting with oneself, you know, starting with the individual will then extend to the workplace. But yes. how do, I mean, you, look, let's be honest. You started, you, you work in Hollywood. Okay, let's- right. <laughs> There's a whole stigma there. You know, there's a whole stigma here, obviously, with Harvey Weinstein and beyond. But let's just start with Hollywood there. You live mm -hmm. in LA. That's where you focus on right now in your media companies and publishing yep. companies. How in the world do you actually start to put dignity back into the workplace? Well, it's very simple. First of all, you got to check yourself first. 
how am I, you know, I'll give you a very clear example. Like I was working with a, a senior executive the other day. Yeah. And she was talking about how she comes into a meeting and she feels that she's gotten to a place where she was brought in from a tech company. She comes into a media company and she was brought in for a certain kind of experience, but there's kind of a disconnect between the value that she's bringing, the culture, and somehow there's a bit of a disconnect. There's not quite a match. So she's feeling, I don't really bring value. And I'm saying, of course you bring value. But what's happening is because when she's showing up, she's already showing up in a place where she's not confident, she doesn't feel as prepared, she doesn't feel like she can be improvisational, and so she doesn't really feel supported in that environment. So what she'll do is, as a result, she'll want to bring other team members in to supplement herself. Well, <laughs> at the end of the day, people in a room are looking at the team, but they're looking at the team leader. And so if she doesn't look strong, the team is not going to look strong. And if they look stronger than her, it's just a bad equation all around. So how you bring dignity in the workforce is first for herself, is for her to have some practices for herself to allow herself to say, how do I project a level of presence and confidence in this conversation? What are the one or two things that I need to contribute and say that I could just prepare before I go into the room that when I come in, I'm a unique contributor? Maybe it's not even a statement that I have to say or an idea, maybe it's a question I need to ask. So that's something very quickly that she almost, you know, if you think of athletes and how they prepare for a game, Michael Phelps is a great example of that. You know, you see him at the headphones, always listening to heavy metal music. You know, I said to her the other day, where's your headphones and the heavy metal music to get, and that's just a small example for her, because then she can bring dignity by her allowing herself to feel the respect, the power, and the safety for her to be how she needs to be in the room. How she brings dignity to her team members who report to her, she says, hey, you know, this guy, I know that he really wants to have more exposure to senior executives. Let me give him a small piece of a presentation that I want him to give. So I give him the support when he comes in the room. He has my respect. He has safety because he knows I'm going to back him up. And he's in a rich environment where he feels he can grow. So I've given myself the dignity. I've done my own mental prep and game. I've given him dignity because I've given him a position where he can grow. And if everything works out, that equation in a very small way has very large dividends at the end. Okay. So first of all, there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to, there's something that I can hear already someone asking, especially women. It's great that your client is a woman because I think there's a lot here, especially in corporate America, of dignity within herself. She doesn't feel valued. That happens a lot. Right. It happens a lot. But what if, what if you're in a same, same client or same situation sure. and she says to you, I don't feel supported by my boss. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, that, that's a common one. I hear my sister who's in big company, big company. And she says that like, that's her number one reason for leaving companies is she yep. doesn't feel she's supported by her superior one of like her direct superior. And she's like, if I don't feel that way, I just, I kind of just deflate. Mm-hmm. What would you say to that? How do you bring dignity to that kind of situation? If you're only coaching that person, Hmm. So there's, so let's take it on a very simple level. Okay. If we're creating kind of this sphere or dignity zone for you, you're going to say to yourself, I'm giving myself trust, respect, and safety that I'm giving to myself. So when I show up wherever I am, so if I'm showing up with my boss, cause I see this happens a lot. My, if I feel like my boss doesn't respect me or doesn't value me or is not putting me in a position to elevate or promote me, every day their level of where I see them starts going down. It just does. It goes down and down and down. And then what happens is people get resigned. Like, ah, it's not gonna change. She is the way she is. Nothing's gonna be any different. And so people get very uh, resigned. Probably that's the best way to say it, resigned. So in that situation, A, she has to know her value and her worth. In these situations, there's not a perfect storm. So there's one thing you can do is talk to your boss about it. And it's very simple. What I mean by that is, if you don't feel respected or trusted by your boss, you can't go in and say, hey, I don't think you ever respect me or ever trust me. It's too emotional. It's too explosive. 
Yeah. But what you could do is, is ask and refer to specific situations that you feel that there's something that's off and inquire. Because what happens is when you get resigned, your curiosity and level of inquiry ceases to exist. So instead, if you go into your boss's, if, you know, schedule time, make sure you're both in the right headspace, you know, not in the place of emergencies. And if you start to inquire newly, let's say it's about a certain specific thing that happened, you didn't feel valued, you didn't feel heard, or you didn't really feel respected. And you start from a place of curiosity, trying to explore what happened, what contributed to that moment. It could have actually had nothing to do with you. It could have had to do with circumstances of news they just found out before they got into the meeting. It could be that they thought they told you something that you didn't really hear it in the same way that they told it to you. So there's so many things that could be off. So what happens I see with people and their bosses is that they ignore it. They may ignore it the first time because mm -hmm. kind of like, what, what happened? They ignore it the first time. They may address it the second time, but they may not address it in the other person's style. So for example, Heather, you're really direct. So if I go to you and go, well, you know, you know, at the other day, I'm not really sure. I think something kind of happened. You'd be like, what, get out. I, I can't even understand. So you have to address it in the other person's style. You have to know who you're relating to. And you have to come from a place of curiosity and genuine inquiry. Mm -hmm. Those are the, the ingredients that you need in order to have a successful dialogue, especially when it's not going to be easy. And you have to be willing, remember you have a responsibility to this too, I have to be willing to hear it. Because I may hear stuff that I don't like, that's really true about me, or that I don't believe to be true, and I got to go back and deal with that too. But there's lots of ways that you to deal with it. But the ingredients are curiosity, inquiry, and asking for the conversation also. Okay, got it. So there's three, is that a step process or is that just like sections or is that a one, two, three? So if you're going to actually, so here's the thing. If you're okay. going to really address an issue with your boss, yeah. Before you go into it, I would say there's five things for you to actually inquire with yourself. Okay, five number, things. Yeah. So number one, you have to ask yourself, what are, what are you feeling about whatever happened? Because you have emotions around it. And your emotions are not necessarily the truth. <laughs> They're just a barometer that gauge you, right? But you got to get it out. So I would stand right then, what are your emotions? How are you feeling about it? Second thing is, what's the truth? Because what you're feeling may not be true. So for example, let's say my boss says that they, um, they I'm feeling like I, I'm disrespected, if I feel like I'm, I'm not heard, if I feel like I, you know, I'm, this is happening. Thought that my, if I thought that my boss was um, angry, if I'm angry at my boss, if I'm upset, if I feel like they've done it before, I gotta write down all those, I would say take a napkin and write down all those emotions. And the second thing is, is it true? So for example, let's say I feel that my boss doesn't treat me with respect, or they, they feel like I believe that they think I'm not doing a great job. So I feel angry, I feel hurt, I feel sad, I feel frustrated, I feel here we go again. But what's the truth? The truth is that maybe we were off in our communication. Maybe I didn't respond to an email when I should have in, t in a timely way. Maybe my boss didn't tell me everything because she didn't have all the answers at that point. So right. you gotta do, what's your emotions, what's the truth? Third thing is what can you take responsibility for? Mm. Because in every situation, there's always something to take responsibility for. Then you have to say to yourself, what are you meant to learn in this situation? Maybe I'm meant to learn that I, my boss and I are like this when we communicate. You know, or that I'm not adjusting my style to her style. You know, what is it that's really, that you're meant to learn in this situation? And then lastly is what action can you take? So if you think of it this way, it's like, what are the emotions? What's the truth? What do you take responsibility for? What is it that's, um, that's the truth? Of what's the truth about the situation? And then lastly, what action can you take? When you learn, what do you meant to, sorry, the fourth is what do you meant to learn? And then what action can you take? When you answer those questions, you're kind of putting yourself in the game to have a tough conversation with anybody. Yeah. Not just anyone that you feel is not respecting you or not valuing you. Right. So what happens? So this is a, this is really great. So first of all, let's go through the, the five real quick. Like, so mm -hmm. really, what are the five again? 
The five R is uh, your emotions. You know, ask, find out what your emotions are. Second thing is what's the truth? What's the truth? What do you take responsibility for? Okay. What is it that you're meant to learn? Mm -hmm. And then the fifth is what action can you take? So first of all, I can hear that you can do that in any area of your life, not just your boss, not also with your um, people that maybe are your team members that you are a leader Mm -hmm. of a team. Um, also your leaders, meaning your, um, your equals, leaders, other leaders. And that kind of brings me back to what you do with the world of dignity and leadership. And again, you work with some big names. Um, mm-hmm. Netflix is a, one of your clients mm-hmm. as well as other ones. Feel free to share that. And uh, with that, I, my question to you is I think it's really powerful. You're one of the few people that I've come across that you are a leader that empowers other leaders to empower the leaders. I mean, Mm -hmm. that's very distinct, right? Because there are people that are in leadership, but then there's people that are the leaders that actually can empower leaders that to teach them to empower other leaders inside their their company, their context. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk about that and what's changed in the last one or two years in your experience with consulting doing that? Well, it's, you know, it's a different game because I find that, it was funny, I was just having this conversation today with a couple of executives in the studio that the game of leadership, at least I'll just speak inside of entertainment companies, I think it's true inside of every company, has shifted so much because of technology. I mean, it has. Technology, um, I mean, this is an old story. Technology, generational differences, ec- economic factors, this has shifted everything. But leaders have more work, less time, and they're on an expectation clock of all the time. They just are. They just are. What compounds it is that we've got a global economy and global business now. So, you know, I have people that are, that are clients of mine. And even though they're dealing with, they may be dealing with domestic issues. They're having conversations with China, conversations with Paris. And, you know, so it's, so every, they may be calling Beijing at one hour and then they're calling, you know, London another hour. So it's, or Moscow another hour. So they're on this, they're, the, the mindset is very changed. It's more open. It's more global. Mm-hmm. So I think that leaders are really struggling because sometimes companies are merging. There's a lot of mergers these days. So people don't quite know what the leadership landscape is. Yeah. Who's jockeying for power inside of companies. Territoriality is more prevalent. And so I think especially like in in companies, you're seeing like in tech companies, a lot of people are trying for more transparency in leadership. Mm-hmm. They want to try to flatten things a little bit more. They want open environments. That's, that's great, but still you need to have private conversations with people. You need to be able, still the same rules applies. We still have to deal with people. Second you deal with people, you have to deal with behavioral issues. You have to deal with performance issues. You got to deal with all of that. But everything is more squeezed because mm-hmm. of time, and because of speed, and because everything is more magnified. So you're on this constant clock. So I find that I work a lot with, because people are needing more boundaries now more than ever. They're needing more standards now more than ever. They're putting up with more things than they've ever put up with before. They don't want to say no, because if I'm saying no, the same, like I'm a senior vice president, another senior vice president is saying yes. So how can I say no if they're saying yes? So that management of peer-to-peer leadership, because that's become the expectation. If you're a senior level person, you're managing large numbers of people Mm -hmm. all the time, communicating all the time. And so you don't want to be the odd man out. Right. So there's more boundaries you need, more standards, and more ways to stop tolerating and to even figure out what you're tolerating. Because you can't operate effectively in this environment. You just can't. You just can't. Right. You can't operate. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you're saying is that part of the dignity is understanding peer-to-peer leadership and what you bring to the table is understanding what pe- what they are personally tolerating and how to communicate that. Is that, is that correct? I mean, yeah. That- I mean, what happens with when, you're, when you reach a level, think mm-hmm. of it this way. When you're a president of a division and you're operating with other presidents, I mean, we're talking about very large amount of fiduciary responsibility, yeah. talking large amounts of people leadership. And so you're, what you need to bring to the game, there's so much pressure on the level of strategic thinking that you need to have. So, I mean, I, for example, like I was working with a guy the other day 
that he was trying to figure out, A, how could he be more global? B, how could he set his organization up with his more successors so he's not doing everything? And then C, how does he give more visibility to those people that he now wants to be doing who are, he thinks are succeeding him? Mm -hmm. And then how does he put himself in a position so if people start jockeying for power, he still gets a piece of the pie? Mm, Positioning, and, right. Because mm -hmm. positional power is very significant. Because it's, and he's a guy that lives by the rule of I live my best self every day. And it, to me, that is like the ultimate of operating in dignity. He says, I'm going to come to work and live the best me that I can. And I promise to help you live the best you. I mean, there's very few people that do that and commit to that. But this is a guy that does it the whole, wow. does it the whole way. But he's still dealing with positional power, <laughs> technological issues, you know, trying to expand different business models, being more strategic, positional power, people jockeying. I mean, full frontal, right in front of him, jockeying for power and right. then trying to just preserve his fiefdom. So I think those are real prevalent issues that people, when they're dealing with peer-to-peer -peer leadership, deal with all the time. Yeah. I love that view, Com coming to work with his best self. That's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of steer off because we've talked about peer-to-peer -peer leadership. We've also about, talked about self-dignity and things mm -hmm. that we can do to come to the table with our own d dignity and making sure that we are basically treating other people with dignity and humanity as well. But let's talk about something I think is very much missing because there isn't a lot of construct. I think the construct of this is kind of disintegrated over the centuries, and that is mentorship. Mm -hmm. and mentorship with dignity and that's something that's in your buyers mentoring with dignity and that is I mean I don't even know where to start with that but that alone <laughs> is so powerful because the day that's just now just now in the last I say year if not two years the companies are just now bringing training and development back to internally right mm -hmm. before then it was that was the first thing that got cut and now there's upset and things like that with the generational conversation of, yeah. the, of the people coming into the corporate world and do we go to them or do they come to us and how does that work so let's just kind of open that box here that you do work with big companies and you do create mentorship programs and helping them mentor with dignity but let's just start there what exactly does that mean and how do you do that well, it's a funny thing because I think that mentorship, well, let's just take that and we'll go right into dignity, is that mentoring is one of the most sacred things that you could provide to somebody else. You know, think about it, if you think of it as a stair step, like when you first come into the workplace, you're dealing with your own level of humanity. Like how do I bring me more fully and completely to work? Then once you get that even a little traction under your legs, you start overseeing people. Then you get to see what the distinction of me in my new humanity, or my deeper humanity, managing other people. And then how do I give that back to others through mentoring? Yeah. So lots of companies have mentoring programs. I think we can't ignore that because we have to say that lots of companies have it. But what happens is that companies will pair you up, give you a little something, something, little training or something and have you go off and do whatever that you need to do with that. And there's, or they'll give you a few topics and that's it. That's right. But right. what I think is that, you know, if we're going with the philosophy and the, and the, the uh, definition that dignity is about the respect, trust, and safety that you create for yourself and you create then outwardly for others. Mentorship is how do I bring everything that I've learned in the world, my humanity, how do I manage teams, and then how do I impart it to you in a way that gives you a space to grow with trust, respect, and safety. It's almost like I'm giving you my brain, and I'm helping you grow in a way that continues to develop your humanity. Mm. So that is an awesome responsibility on anybody, both ways. Because if you talk to mentors, they'll always say, I got a lot more than I think my mentee even got. Because, you know, when you give, you get more back. So what's so vital, now if we turn it into organizations, what's so vital is that we give people the tools to be successful at mentoring. Because it's not enough if we give them a little something. It's kind of like if you drop someone off on an island and you gave them some Ritz crackers <laughs> and you said, eat up, <laughs> and then you <laughs> 
come back for a year. That's kind of what this is like. Yeah. It's, you're assuming a lot of things, which is, I think, one of the biggest things that, that create areas of uh, dis, uh, undignified workplace, shall we say. Yeah. Is when we don't give people the tools, because we assume when we give them a title that they have it. Yeah. And that's not true. Just because we give them a title, they don't got it all. They don't. So when you pair people up and you say, hey, Heather, mentor Esther, because you know more than I do, and then you just shove them out in the world and you say, because you have 20 years experience, 30 years experience, you're just going to make it work. I have to tell you time and time again, it doesn't. We need to care and feed and provide an environment where this pairing can survive and thrive. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of mentorship and dignity is not just is the preservation of that relationship to allow for it to be operating in a dignified way for the company has a responsibility to give it trust and respect and safety. Also, you right. do that by training, by development, by resources. That's the where that pairing can grow and then naturally come to its own conclusion, if it, you know, depending on how you work it all. But that's what's, it's, it's sorely missing. Cause I see lots of companies doing lots of matching and matching, matching. It's like a, you know, it's like Tinder for executives, right? <laughs> you send them off, but they, but they don't have enough tools to, to sustain it. It's the sustainability that falls up. And then there's, there's not a lot of dignity in that afterwards. No. There's not. When you said uh, something, that I just had this vision. You said when you give someone a title, people expect them to have it and they don't. I always think of like parents, you know, first time parents are like, just because there's a baby born doesn't mean they know what the hell's happening. You know? <laughs> like I am a father and mother, but that doesn't mean I know what the hell to do over here. No. No. So, I mean, that happens a lot. That's hopefully there's grandparents around to say, okay, this is what you do. And it's, it's true. Like, right. It's like, okay, I'm dealing with the kid, the baby. Now it's like, okay, I got this. Now the dang thing's like 10. Now what? Like, how <laughs> so, I think it's the same concept of just the mentoring as you move along. And so what are you finding is happening currently at the, what I call the current state of businesses and mentorship? And then what do you provide? Like, what exactly are you doing and bringing in? So what's happening inside a company, say, first of all, there's a lot of cool things that are happening with mentoring, meaning that, that it's happening at all. Okay. It's that's great. Good. And there are success stories in it. That's also great. But we have to forget, we have to remember, if not, if not forget, we have to remember that mentoring is a very powerful retention tool. Companies mm -hmm. today, no people true. are being more transient inside leaving you know this it used to be you could work for a company for 5 10 15 years and that was seen as great now if you work at a company for 2 years they're wondering what happened to you because you should be cycling around more and so there's if we're losing if really we need more talent and companies just think of the cost let's just think of the dollars and cents companies are losing money because they're having to go out and recruit and hire and then retrain, redevelop, and reindoctrinate people into their culture. And sometimes people are a great culture fit, and sometimes they're not. You know, you're you're betting on a horse. It happens to be a person. You know, you're making a good bet on it. But right. just think of the loss of time, effort, energy, money in order to do that. So mentorship is a really powerful retention tool. I think it's important to say that because companies lose sight of that. Like when you were saying earlier that training is the first thing that gets cut. I think when it comes, comes down to, they'll cut mentorship programs because people will just say, hey, you know, we got these senior executives and I hear this all the time, but we don't want to ask too much of the senior executives. And someone said this to me today. I don't, I said, you know, mentoring is a really powerful uh, retention tool. And they said, well, we don't want to ask for our senior executives too much. <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is when they're hired for, see, this is what gets often mistaken. When you're hired at a company as a senior executive, we know that in there, your responsibility is to do your job in your job. Mm -hmm. But your responsibility is to give back to the company, to help the company grow. Right. You're mentoring and you're helping that person that you're mentoring retain, become inspired, become reinvigorated, become more excited, have more ideas, become more innovative. You're doing something that's exponential for the company. So the good stuff, I think what we forget is that it's a retention tool. 
So there's good stuff that's happening because people are mentoring. They're even doing these reverse mentoring programs, which is like the old codgers get, get someone that's young and new that knows Snapchat, that can teach them Snapchat. So you know, there are these things that are happening that are really great. The other side that like what we bring is we go into companies and we say, we need some level of sustainability for mentoring. Yeah. So what does that look all the way through? Are, is it going to be, because remember, mentoring can go on forever, but if you're going to create a program and you're going to create formality around it, which yeah. we really recommend, and you create a container for it for six months, nine months, 12 months, whatever the duration is, then the responsibility of us is to make sure that you've got a container of learning, mm. development, growth, nurturing for you. And if the, remember, if the relationship doesn't work, we got to get fast on it to switch up the partnership. Because just because I've got a great senior executive and a great high potential executive, they may not mesh. Yeah. And right. so let's say they don't mesh, then you don't pull them both out. You may pull them both out from each other. You keep right. them in the program. You just get other people for them. So we do, we run all of that. We run the matching. We run the onboarding, we run, we run the continued development, we do all of it. It's like the dating process. You match them, <laughs> you date them, you make sure yeah. they're dating. Yeah. We make sure they get married. We make sure they get married. Get married. Right, yeah. your matchmaking process. I just heard that, like, it's a process, like the matching. <laughs> it's really true. So, and the mentorship of that, I think it's the mentorship part of the, in the dignity part, I kind of want to just, like, weave in here. Of the yeah. How are you bringing dignity inside of mentorship like how are you bringing that to the fourfold today especially media companies well let's go back because yes. if we say that what's missing is really trust mutual trust respect and safety inside of companies yeah and we're saying that you got to bring it first you got to bring it for you first you got to teach it for you bring it for you first then we got to allow for you to help bring that out and to teach that to other people create that in teams then what's another great way for you to spread that word and to teach that to other people is through mentoring. And then what a great way to emulate it by creating the sacredness of a one-to-one -one relationship and saying that in this relationship, we'll create trust, respect, and safety. I'm going to model it for you. I'm going to teach you how to practice it. You're going to practice it so that you can bring it back inside to the company and to the organization and to the people that you serve too. So that's, and as the company, we bring dignity to the mentoring relationship because we give you the resources by which to thrive. Right. That's how you get full circle dignity mm -hmm. in a mentoring relationship. You know, you said something interesting when you're the, whoever you were speaking to earlier today or this mm -hmm. week said, well, we don't want to ask too much of the executives. Every yeah. time I know that either I've mentored somebody or someone I know else know has mentored I think the mentor gets more out of it. They do. You know, it's like, <laughs> I want to share with you, I've been dealing with for the last 15 years. And I want to help you like make sure you don't hit that tree. I hit that tree. So maybe that's I'm right. going to help you not hit that tree. I that's think right. that that's interesting that that particular person, whoever had that view, you don't want to ask them. It's more like, I think, especially executives level at any level, someone, anyone who's been in any career for more than 10 years, at least, they have so much they they don't even know what they know they don't know and once they start helping people i think they get more out of it. it's like parenting you know parents mm -hmm. parenting talks about that all the time too it's like i think that the parents get more out of it sometimes than the kids and vice versa so um so i just kind of want to wrap it up inside of mentoring and dignity and what you're doing what what are you creating now for the next five years in your business and where do you think things are headed because things have altered big time in 2016 17 and we're right. currently in 2018 but where do you see things headed and where does you see mind light group really you know filling in the gaps of what's needed well i think that this is a very timely conversation right now about dignity because I think it's something that we're seeing a perfect storm hit. People are talking about women's issues. They want diversity. They want representation for diversity. I mean, you're seeing that there's movies that have women in them do better. Women's that, movies that are directed by women do better. I mean, you're seeing that there is a sea change 
where people are saying that it directly comes down to money when you have more diversity, you have more uh, representation of different genders around. So what I see that's happening in the workforce is you're wanting that level of humanity more at work. You want more, people are wanting dignity more at work. People, um, CEOs that are smart are saying, what's wrong? I mean, what are you gonna do now when Charlie Rose has been now convicted of molesting a woman? I mean, seriously, at, at your wow. company, aren't you gonna sit and say, what culture have we created in order for this to fester? And right. remember, the second, something we didn't talk about, the second that you take credit for someone else's ideas, you've already created a culture that doesn't have dignity in it. Mm. So if we're looking to build cultures where people feel like they can be set up for success, the tide is turning. People want to feel valued. They want mm. to feel like they're a contributor. They want to be able to give back to the world around them. That all has to do with creating more dignified human humanity brought out in the workforce. If we're not doing that's where I really see work going, that we're wanting that and people are asking for it. And unfortunately, what's happening is it's coming out in very ugly ways, like what you're seeing now, but people are feeling more liberated as a result of it. But what I see that's happening is, my, or at least my hope for the future, is we can bring more dignity and more humanity gentler and more easeful that it doesn't have to be in the culmination of tragedy or something terrible happening in order for there to be awake for a culture to be awakened for it to adjust mm -hmm. interesting yeah um that's interesting talking about the different mood two movements and the changes but um i want to pick on something you said earlier way earlier in the conversation mm -hmm. which talking about mentorship in the container and you said uh the dignity zone. And that, that's mm -hmm. exactly what I heard is like this container is giving people, I mean, use the word safe space to be able to be freed up to speak up and mm -hmm. have the voice and say, let me give you humanity and I want humanity back in the return and kind of creating this zone within ourselves and our teams and to corporate and as well as executive. I think that's pretty brilliant. That's actually really brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the intention of how it goes. <laughs> At least yeah. that's our mission. <laughs> well, you're doing well. That's awesome. So um, you are definitely a powerhouse game changer. So any last words that you want to say and just where can people find you and just any last words? Yeah. So a couple of things. So people go to, they can definitely find me online, mindlightgroup.com. They can find me on Twitter, Esther Weinberg. They can find me on LinkedIn. Just look up Esther Weinberg. They can even look up Mindlight Group, which is the name of my company. So either one, either of those places are great ways to find me. The only thing that I would say, the last words I would say is, mm -hmm. remember, it is up to you. No matter what your circumstances, no matter what your situation is at work, it is up to you to be a game changer, is to allow yourself to create that level of dignity for you. Look, you might be in a place where you're really valued and respected, rock on, that's great. If you're in a place where you don't feel empowered, you still have a, a choice to create a dignity zone to change it inside your company, or you can leave. You know, every culture is not fit for you. But the but the end of the day is for you to honor your humanity because no one can take that from you. No one. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's really powerful. And I want to just kind of reread um, part of your bio here. It says personal power through dignity, leadership with dignity, and bringing dignity back into business one conversation at a time. You got it. You got it. All right, Esther, thank you so much for being here. You can check out Esther at mindlightgroup.com and that's Esther, Esther Weinberg is spelled for you. W-E-I-N-B-E-R-G. All right, everyone, this is Heather Havenwood. You can check me out at heatherhavenwood.com. And until then, be you, be real, be the boss of your life. Bye, guys. Thank you, Heather. Bye.